Well, good morning, everybody. I'm going to start you off with something we've been talking about the last few days, which was this rapidly intensifying low that was off the coast of California. Satellite data here from yesterday really just shows how intense this system was as it moved right over the top of San Francisco. And ahead of this were some very strong winds, also some pretty large thunderstorms, including numerous reports of winds 50 to 70 miles an hour, plus a large storm in Nevada that even produced winds up to 97 miles an hour. This system, once again, has put down even more snow into California. California's mountains, but also delivered quite a bit of rainfall throughout much of the state. And as it works its way here over the four corner states, we're going to watch this system eventually eject into the central United States, where just here in the last uh, couple of days, we've already seen some relatively heavy rains that have come into parts of the Mid-South. This will be an area I'm going to watch for more flooding going forward. And also snow here, more snow here in the upper um, Midwest and Northern Plains. And that's going to be an ongoing story. If we just look back uh, at six hour chunks of total snowfall, so this would be yesterday, but you're starting to see the snow evolve here. Then if we look uh, into yesterday afternoon and evening, even more snow coming into this area. And then last night, another six inches fell on parts of the Red River Valley of the North. You kind of add all that up. That's another just, uh, you know, addition to the snowpack that is in that area. And having a look at this, this is the snow water equivalent map. I'm working on trying to assess... Um, what the snow water equivalent looks like compared to history. I've got a lot of data just to, to do this, but I'd like to I'd like to spend a little more time distilling this down because there's a lot of question as to how this snow begins to melt and what how long it's going to take to melt, one, and then two, what it might mean for spring flooding and also a lot of folks just thinking about prevented plant acres. Uh, this map comes from John Newton, uh, Senate Act Committee for Republicans. Um, great map just last year showing the prevented plant acres we had across the country. And last year's prevented plant was not necessarily from the snow. It was actually from just persistent rains and very cold conditions actually across the whole of the north interior of the United States, extending into Manitoba uh, as well here. So we just, we this is fresh in our memory and there's going to be a lot of question as to whether or not we're going to see large prevented plant acres again this year. So we're going to work on that and, and see what we can come up with um, in terms of our forecast. One thing I do know is that if you look at the total snowfall expected over the next 10 days, we do have a couple more systems that could deliver more snow to parts of Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan. We have some snow that's coming into to New England. And also uh, this again is the snow. Some of this was from last night, but we're looking here at the probability of, of at least three more inches of snow. We do have, um, just because of the trajectory of storm systems kind of following, let me try that again, following something like this, uh, we notice that to the north of it, we've got enough cold air at times just to just to continue to produce this snow. So um, we're not out of the woods yet with the you know the additional accumulation. And yesterday, the National Weather Service um, did issue this risk of heavy snow, a slight risk in this area, from March 29th through April 4th. Now we're expecting this for the west because we continue to see large ridging happening. Uh, over the Aleutian Islands, and that's just delivering more troughs of low pressure into the western United States. So this was, um, you know, the, the snowfall amounts we're expecting here from the upper Colorado Basin to the Sierra Nevada to the, um, you know, the Great Basin, even up into parts of the Pacific Northwest. That's going to be an area that's going to continue to build quite a bit of late season snowpack, keeping things cold and uh, very delayed for spring. But uh, south of that, or south and east of that, if we look at how much um, rainfall might be uh, falling into this area, as these systems roll through, they'll leave lingering fronts here. They're going to turn into like stationary fronts on which the next system will follow. And that's why we see from Oklahoma, you know, through the Ohio River Valley, you know, this entire region, including the Tennessee Valley, high probability of getting at least an inch of rain. Some places in here, uh, possibly two to four inches of rain. So we, we just have a lot of early spring delays happening in some key growing areas uh, across the country because of either too much rain or, um, or too cold and too snowy. Our all hazards weather map today is pretty busy again as so we have flood watches out for uh, San Joaquin Valley. Winter storm warnings dotted throughout the west including the four corner states and very strong winds that are coming out here um, from the southern uh, plains in the southwest. We have what's left of our winter storm warning here in parts of northern Minnesota. Those winds later today are actually going to set up a warm front right in through this area. See it there? Uh, on uh, south of which we're going to be putting quite a bit of moisture and this is actually going to set up a three-day risk of strong to severe storms that will be in the Midwest today but then 
down here to Texas tomorrow and then over the lower Mississippi River Valley after that. But notice how strong these winds are going to be here coming out of New Mexico into parts of Colorado, Kansas, uh, Oklahoma, and, and Texas. We need to be on the lookout for that today. So the severe storm risk, this is where we're going to just keep an eye out for the risk of stronger storms today. I'm about ready to leave to head over to Viola, Illinois to give a talk. And so we'll be on the lookout for some of those storms later today. But tomorrow uh, on the 23rd, it's going to be into this whole region here. And then you're going to see that the Storm Prediction Center has now increased the lower Mississippi River Valley to an enhanced risk uh, by the time we get to the 24th on Friday. So uh, this situation continues to be monitored carefully as we watch um, just kind of all the ingredients coming together to set up a severe weather risk here. So we'll definitely be watching for that um, here on Friday. So let's kind of take a look at the high resolution year, uh, excuse me, NAM model, just to kind of get a sense of these next few systems. So this is this morning's rain moving over the Tennessee Valley, the snow that's coming out of uh, Minnesota heading into Ontario. And as we play it forward, we're gonna watch the next system here. Remember pr producing that, that warm front uh, in this area. So we have some pre uh, storm rain that's happening right in through here. And then we're going to watch later today as the system comes out of the Four Corner States and Wyoming and begins to line up right along that front. So this is late tonight getting into the overnight hours. And you can see where the model's attempting to put down those storms tonight, uh, possibly right in through this region with a little bit of snow to the north of it. Now that system's going to push east, so more rain here coming from parts of the eastern Corn Belt and eastern Great Lakes tomorrow morning and then into New England. And do you see that lingering front right there? It's actually just sandwiched between a high pressure cell to the south and a high pressure cell uh, to the north. And that frontal boundary is gonna serve as the kind of pathway guiding the next few storm systems that roll through the country. So the next one comes out here Thursday night. So that's where we're watching this area for the stronger storms. And the heavy rains are gonna line up right along that front going into Friday right there. And we have another surge coming on Friday night, and you'll see that when we flip over to our other models here, the GFS on the left and the European on the right. So let's get it queued up there to Friday night, which is right in through here. There we go. And so both models do produce this pretty sizable system that's going to really increase the risk of the severe storms in the lower Mississippi River Valley with heavy rains right here along the Ohio River. And as we play this for that system, uh, interestingly enough, in the models, they're starting to get a little bit better agreement on the snow potential in Iowa, Illinois, and, and, and southern Wisconsin. This is still going to be a tricky forecast, even though it's only, you know, 84 hours away from us. We're going to have to be watching carefully for where that snow could be. The GFS a bit farther to the east, the European a bit farther to the west. These are subtle differences, but they mean a lot to the people that are in this area. So that system then rolls north, spreading snow over southern Wisconsin, Michigan, into Ontario and Quebec. Possibly some snows pretty deep into the interior of New England, given how warm the air is out ahead of this and the fact that the system is lifting. And then what we watch is storms already by Sunday showing up again over the south and another system kind of taking shape here. Now the European model today went over the same area that it was producing snow later this week uh, for early Monday, delivering more snow into this area, early next week, excuse me, on Monday, delivering more snow here. And while that's occurring, another coastal low comes into California. I right hear the California Oregon border, it's in both models. And that's why we continue to see these deeper lows rolling through the West, adding more precipitation. And, you know, they don't need any more out of this. We have plenty of moisture here. It is important to note that the temperatures will be pretty wildly fluctuating through this. We'll have major warm-ups followed by very, you know, abrupt drops in temperature throughout much of the country. And I'll show you those more in a few moments. But I wanted to at least kind of highlight where the European model is attempting to put down more snow. So this is the current system. This is the one that went through California, adding more snow to the upper Colorado Basin. And then you see that snow, you know, through Nebraska, Iowa, southern Wisconsin. That's kind of round one. Round two starts right here, Friday night to Saturday morning. Now, this, again, is just an operational run, but I wanted you to see where the European was putting down the heavier snow in this area. And then you're going to see some snow spreading into New England. This is Saturday night into Sunday. So you can see right in through here. And then um, as we play into that second system next Monday, it's trying to add more snow into parts of Iowa. Now remember, we do not have good model agreement and even the ensembles are not picking up on this. But it's just important to see where these individual runs are dropping some of the snow so we can just continue to monitor the changes together. That's why we, we do these videos every day. But if I just take it all the way out and just run it out 10 days, we do see here, you know, 
there's more snow coming to the upper Midwest and Northern Plains. There's quite a bit more snow coming into the Intermountain West. And um, as a result, this pattern really is on repeat for a while. If I had to distill this all down into one map, I'd say that this map really kind of captures what we're expecting here. We are wetter where we've been wetter, and we are unfortunately drier where we've been drier. So I'm talking about the plains, the western plains, you know, southern Canada, the Canadian prairie, and parts of the Pacific Northwest. While well, we expect flooding here and more snow and rain in the west. What's important is to always compare this to the last 30 days. And so we know that, like I said, the places that have been wet and snowy are going to stay that way, and the places that have been drier are going to stay that way. So there seems to be some persistence in this pattern. On the temperature side of it, the next seven days, okay, we, we see more mild air where we just had the very deep and long-lasting frost event over the south. But we're not done with the colder air here just yet. But everywhere on this map that you see gray is where the National Digital Forecast Database is projecting a temperature at or below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. If we take a look at where those high temperatures, uh, what they're going to look like. Here's that warm front setting up later today on Wednesday. We're looking at high temperatures compared to normal. Thursday, that large warm sector building from Texas all the way to New York and Maine, but the colder air coming in behind it pretty quickly. So this is now getting into Friday, high temperatures, and Saturday. And then as we play into next week, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. So that's your next seven days. What I'm concerned about is after that, pulling down more of that colder air, because like I said, it's going to be coming in, in waves. And that's really captured quite well by the European model. Five day sliding window of average temperature anomalies. So there's, there's the first, this is the warmth over the next five days and where the cold air is still uh, trapped here. But then what we see is it fading as we finish the month of March, but a quick warm up for early April right here. This is kind of the first five days of April and then the temperatures drop back off again. So we're not breaking away into a full warm pattern and I don't necessarily see that happening for much of the, for example, the Midwest, the Canadian Prairie or the East. I don't see that happening for at least another 20, maybe 25 days. Um, I could be wrong and that could, it could get here earlier. It depends on a lot of things moving uh, in, in, in the, um, especially in the uh, tropics, Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean but uh, we'll keep watching it. We are getting kind of a snow feedback here in the West, keeping this quite cold, and it might be a while before the Western United States fully breaks away into spring warmth, uh, which is um, gonna really delay a lot of the crops in the West. Last couple things. <clears throat> On our website, agweather.com, ag-wx.com, you can look at soil temperatures, plus I put it in the individual city forecast graphics. And when you watch these animations, these are four inch soil temperatures in degree Fahrenheit. And um, this contour line represents the 50 degree isotherm, and this one is the 32 degree. Now I'm just going to play this fast, but what we're watching for here is for, especially for those corn and soybean growers in this area, we want that 50 degree isotherm to get north of you and stay north of you. So as we play this forward, we notice that it keeps surging north, as it normally does in spring, but a full breakaway to a big warm pattern where it just gets north and stays north uh, may take some time. So we're just going to keep watching this and monitoring it going forward. Lastly, I want to give you a quick update on South America. The forecast is showing up a little bit drier than it had the last couple of days for much of Brazil. This is going to help with the finish of harvest and the planting of safrina crops, even though you see it drier than normal here in Mato Grosso. They're still expecting you know, one to three inches of rain. That's still a little drier than normal here. The wettest conditions are in parts of Paraguay, but really into Argentina, Uruguay, and um, and uh, southern Brazil, like uh, Rio Grande do Sul. And so this is an area that uh, was, of course, an exceptional drought now showing up uh, wetter with time here. So um, I'll keep watching it and report back to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Thanks.